Hello and welcome to a new series of Sunday Politics. As the Casement Park Euro Dream is finally killed off, what next for the redevelopment of the stadium? We'll get reaction to the news. The UK government will not fund the project from the President of the GA and the Stormont Finance Minister. And joining me to assess the political and economic consequences of the decision, the Belfast Telegraph, Suzanne Breen and economist Andrew Webb. Now we begin this morning with the announcement that the UK government will not now fund the redevelopment of Casement Park in time for the Euro 2028 Championships. It was announced late on Friday night in a letter to Gordon Lyons from Hillary Benn and Culture Secretary Lisa Nandy. In fact, it came just a day after the First and Deputy First Ministers, along with the Finance Minister, met with the Chancellor in London. Well, I'm joined now by the GA President, uh, Jardeth Burns. We learned of this decision at 10 past seven on Friday evening on social media. How were you informed about it? Yeah, the same way. All of us uh, found out about this dump of bad news at seven o'clock on a Friday evening. It's not really the way to do business. Um, but to be honest, we've known about this for some months. Um, we've been, as you know, I've been pessimistic about it. I, I'd made that very clear back in May. Because once March came, it was really the second week of March that the tender documents were ready. We could not understand why they weren't issued because there was urgency right from the word go. When we were approached last year to see if we would be willing to allow Casement to be used as one of the main stadia for Euro 2028, we were excited. The IFA were very excited by it. It was a wonderful opportunity for all of Northern Ireland to come together on a major project to see if we could do this. Unfortunately, we have failed. And uh, now for the GA, the priority for us is to build Casement and that, that's really what we are going to put all of our energy so, in. So who do you blame for this, that we're now in this position where you've had two commitments from two governments and they've reneged on both? Well, I, I think personally the Labour government did their best. Whenever they come into power, they were up against the clock. We knew that. Even coming into May, we knew it was going to be very difficult to get this across the line because the stadium was going to have to be up and running for a full year uh, to road test it against the specifications of the Euro 2028 competitions. We knew we were up against it. I feel that the Labour government did their best in the two or three months that they had, but they were up against it and obviously then... It, we, we knew it wasn't going to work and we were just waiting for the bad news to come and then it eventually did. From come. the outside looking in, do you get a sense that the government strung this out, basically, because they knew the clock was ticking? They knew at some stage they would reach a point where they would simply run out of time. Is that what's happened here? Well, we have to try and accept the bona fides of, of, of the government. We felt that they did put a lot of energy into this. We were expecting maybe it was going to take a month of them for them to get round to get the Casement Park issue. But right from the word go, Hillary Benn was talking positively about the pro prospect of Casement being built. And and for a time, our pessimism changed to optimism. And even last week at the family talks with the Irish government, we were starting to get optimistic that there was going to be a major announcement there. Mm -hmm. But obviously, there's been a lot of bad news given out in the last week. I think that they have come to the conclusion that there's very little money left and they had to make very difficult decisions. And I suppose it's the way in which it happened is disappointing. But we in the GA feel that the damage was done back in March whenever the tender documents weren't issued because we were really up against the clock at that stage. In terms of the figures that have now been put in the public domain, the government says the cost has risen <clears> dramatically. <throat> They're now talking about more than £400 million. That's a massive jump from where we were initially. Do, do you recognise those figures? Do you believe those figures are accurate? No, those figures certainly don't align with the figures that we've had. And the Ulster GA have been working very closely with a consultant team of stadia experts for the last 10 years. They were coming in with a completely different set of figures based on... What are those figures? Well, I don't, this is very commercially sensitive because we do hope to go out to tender again. And I don't want to be given the exact figures but there were almost 100 million, maybe less than what we were talking about here from, from a, a group of consultants that come in and spend three weeks uh, in Northern Ireland, benchmarked the specifications of a GAA stadium against Premier League stadiums with all of the overlay, the, the, the fit out that they have, and obviously that there, there needs to be fully seated stadia and segregation as well and all of the security implications there. GAA stadia are much more modest uh, uh, affairs, I have to say, and... I just feel that that was unfair to come out with that figure of 400 million because it certainly didn't align with any of the figures that we have had from our con management consultants who are stadia experts who have worked with Ulster GA for the last 10, 12 years and have actuarially uh, uh, benchmarked our stadium against our other GA stadiums. So let's focus on, on where to next because we're now left in a <clears> scenario where you're going to have a GAA only stadium, for instance, you're going to have to work out the cost. You're going to have to figure out where that, what money is going to come from. Do you have a figure as to what that's going to cost? 
not, well, we do in our, in our heads, which I'm not going to divulge today, and if you don't mind, because that is commercially sensitive. Because if we do go out to tender, we have to make sure that the tender companies come back with a figure that is realistic. And we felt if that had happened in March, then we would have had a figure in the market that we could have worked off and not this top of the head stuff that we were raising every day. And I will say that the last year has cost everybody a lot of money because we know that the cost of fabrication and construction and steel is rising exponentially against, uh, far greater than the cost of inflation. Mm -hmm. So the Ulster GAA and all of us have lost out. We've really wasted a full year because of this pantomime we've had in the last year. But you know, of course, the financial picture out there is pretty bleak, not just in Belfast, but obviously, crucially, yeah. in London as well. How are you going to begin that process now of trying to get money from London for your, your GAA stadium, knowing the many other pressures out there the government is facing? Yeah, and if we look at, at superficially on the source there is that argument to be made. But if we look at what the contribution that the GAA makes to Irish society and to the society in Northern Ireland, you will see that we are definitely deserving of government money. So in this very city, for example, under the, the, we, we have been working with the Belfast City Council. We have invested one million in pitches because we are chronically under-provised uh, in, in, in Belfast for pitches. We have invested three million in this city as well, in Galefast, and this is an important point. I am opening a pitch today in Money Glass and a walking track uh, for, for, from, for a community that have just raised all of that money themselves. Last week it was in yeah. Brooke, we're but, doing but, it. But, but GA communities yeah, that, that's invest fine, but millions just, every let's year. Let's just cut to the yes, chase of yes. what this is going to be because we know already there's about £120 million on the table. Previous commitments from the the executive around £62 million, £40 million now from the Irish government, £15 million, of course, from the, the GA. You will want Stormont perhaps to increase its allocation. Is the GA prepared to step up and, and offer more money as well? Well, I spoke to Michelle O'Neill this morning and we've been speaking to uh, politicians all over the weekend and she is adamant that casement will be built and that the money will be found to build casement. But to be honest, at this point in time, we are still waiting. We are waiting now. Uh, Hilary Benn, in the last paragraph of that letter, has said that they will make a financial commitment to casement. And we do know that even Rishi Sunak said in that very garbled and very well-prepared statement he made in his one-day visit to Northern Ireland pre-election that there would be a substantial amount of money given to casement. All we are asking the British government now is, tell us how much so we can build our stadium. And just to be clear, is the GA prepared up its allocation as well, or, or is that 15 million? That's it. Well, the allocation that we have at the moment is 58 million. That's the money that we have pledged ourselves, plus the money to be negotiated off the Irish government. That's well, almost well, matching you know, the of executive. Course, that's not what it says on the label. The Irish government money is Irish government money, it's not GA money. That money was negotiated by the GAA, and that's the money that we are bringing to the table 58 million, and it's very important that we recognise that. So, do you believe that given the financial picture that we now face, that we will see? a stadium built in casement before the Euros begin, even, for instance, in 2028. Will we, will we have matches being played there by then? Well, looking and listening to what people have been saying to us, because it really is in the hands of other people in terms of the money that they're going to give us to build that stadium. And remember that we were the people who stayed in the maze project right until the very end. It wasn't our fault that any of this happened. We stayed in, in this process as well in good faith. And I think that the least that can happen now is that West Belfast has a proper casement park where we can play all the finals. And remember, there will be a dividend back to the government in terms of tax for that. 20% bat on every ticket. Very soon that money will be recouped back to the government. Think of the legacy in terms of hospitality yeah. and tourism and construction and transport. Yeah. All of those things will bring that money back. I just back need to ask quickly. you about another story as well. Hilary Benn made this announcement by Casement on Friday. He also made an announcement that he is ruling out a public inquiry into murder of Sean Brown. Of course, a well-known GAA figure. You've been with the Brown family throughout on this particular journey. What are your thoughts on that decision? Well, if there was disappointment uh, in the GAA about the Casement decision, there was quite a lot of anger about this. Um, 1997, something that we thought was a random sectarian murder. Whenever the coroner's court began investigating, it discovered that there was 25 people involved. There was many, many government agents. One of the agents, um, the surveillance on him was dropped just the night before the murder happened. There are so many unanswered uh, questions. And then, of course, use of public interest immunity certificates uh, on, on redacted material on something that we thought was just a random sectarian murder. And it was the coroner who said that the only way to find out the truth of what happened to a GA chairman, a Palahi GA, was by a public inquiry. That is extremely disappointing. Charlotte Burns, we're going to leave it there, but thank you very much indeed for coming in to share your thoughts with us on the programme this morning. Now, let's continue with that topic and hear from the Stormont Finance Minister, Dr. Kiva Archibald. Uh, Minister, you held a meeting with the Chancellor on Thursday. Was there any indication then in London that this decision around casement was coming on Friday evening? 
Um, thanks, Senda. Um, and I suppose just let me say, first of all, this is a, a new Labour government that has talked a lot about resetting and, and rebuilding relationships. And I think their actions over the past couple of days haven't really aligned with those words. Um, we had the communication on Friday afternoon around the city deals, um, hugely disappointing and concerning um, in relation to those. And then after months of dither and delay from the previous um, British government, we had the, the news slipped out on a Friday evening about Casement Park um, as if the calculation was it was a good day for bad news given everybody was already angry over the, the case or over the city deals um, announcement. Um, hugely disappointing in relation to uh, the Casement Park not being built in time for the Euros. Such a missed opportunity um, economically but also for, for local football. I think what we need to see now from the British government is um, them honouring their commitment to the to fund in Casement Park and for them to put their, their money on the table. And I, and I would also urge them to reflect over the past couple of days and, and how things have, have played out. Um, and maybe we need a, a bit of a reset on the reset. Speaking of money now, we know, of course, according to the government, the cost was, was running up over £400 million. Is that a figure you recognise? Was that figure ever circulated around the executive table? Um, there have been a lot of figures put out about Casements Park and every time a figure is put out there it's, it's larger than before. The the 400 million figure isn't one that I'm aware of. I don't know the basis of the figure. I will be seeking clarification on it. Um, and obviously the, the, um, the, the building of Casement Park for the Euros had a, a particular specification to it. Um, we need to see now clarification from the British government about their level of funding commitment towards building Casement Park. It will be built. It is a, an executive commitment is, is in the programme for government uh, and we need to get on now and get that project delivered. What are your thoughts about how all this was handled by the Communities Minister Gordon Lyons because we know some of your Lyons colleagues out there accused him of sitting in his hands throughout this particular process. Are you content that he did what he could to try and move this forward? Well, I, I think that um, we had the, the problem with the, the dithering um, by the British government in relation to their funding commitment. It, it was my view that, um, uh, similar to, to Jareth Burns that was on there before, that, that we should have went out to tender and, and sought that. Um, but we are where we are with this now. It's really, really disappointing. I think the opportunity that has been lost to, to host that tournament and to have you know those games played here on, on our own doorstep is, but, is so disappointing. But we and, to, uh, we don't need to tell you about the financial pressures that's out there because in some ways this will come as a surprise and other ways it won't come as a surprise given the fact that Keir Starmer is telling us that the cupboards are, are, are basically bare. What now in terms of financing this project? We know the executive has already previously committed 11 years ago to £62 million. Pounds. Is that offer going to be increased? Well, there, there is um, uh, contributions on the table from, from the executive, from the Irish government and from the GAA. We need to see what the British government is putting on the table in relation to it. They need to honour their commitment in relation to the funding. And then as an executive commitment, as, a, as a, an executive flagship project, funding will, will flow towards that. Um, this is a really important project. It's, it's important, obviously, to remember that, that it was that part of a three-stadium project. funding will um, flow, but uh, can you project. give us a sense of a guarantee this morning that, that the money will, in fact, be increased, given the fact that the financial picture, the costs and everything has risen substantially in the course of those 11 years. So you're going to be asking your executive colleagues to increase that £62.5 million offer? I think we need to see what the British government is putting on the table. They need to honour their funding commitments and then we need to see what it is going to take to deliver this, the stadium. It is important also to emphasise that Casement Park was part of a, a three-stadia commitment. The other two are built, they're up and running and the uh, Ulster Gales need to have the commitment uh, fulfilled to the, the, the delivery of Casement Park also. And do, you, do you think that all the key players here need to be open-minded about the possibility of increasing their offer? The GAA included, for instance. Do you think is that something that's going to have to be revisited at some stage in the future? There has been over a decade of delays um, in relation to this project. Obviously, things have um, increased in relation to costs. They've increased over the course of the past year uh, significantly. Um, and we, we now need to see what the cost of the project is going to be. We need to see the British government fulfilling its commitment and putting its money on the table. Um, and then we will need to get this project over the line and delivered. But you know, of course, the fact that this may now land back on the lap of the Stormont executive, a potential fresh battleground, given the pressures in health and education and elsewhere, to try and argue for a lot more money for a stadium. Uh, it's going to be tricky, isn't it? Well, I think we have to... Um, we have to 
be clear on, on, in the difference in relation to the funding streams for the delivery of, of day-to-day services and our education and health service and then um, capital infrastructure investment as well. And I think we also need to be mindful not just of the investment that it will require to deliver a casement park, but the economic potential of doing so, not just in terms of when it's up and running and you have games being played and other events being hosted, but even the construction of that stadium in, in and of itself will bring um, economic opportunities opportunities and, and create jobs in the local area. Okay. So we have to balance okay. these things up against each other. OK, let's widen the, the scope now, if you like, and talk about city deals, because we got the announcement on Friday, they were to be paused, and then we get some announcement last night to say that they're going to unpause some of these announcements. Just what is the position this morning? Well, I think that this was a hugely concerning um, announcement. It was news that we just got on Wednesday um, afternoon before we were meeting with the Treasury. Obviously, I raised it with the tre- Chancellor on, on Thursday um, and uh, was advised to engage with the Chief Secretary to the Treasury, which I did, and asked for an urgent call, a call I haven't yet had, which is deeply disappointing. They went ahead and announced on, on Friday afternoon that the pause was happening to deal partners, um, causing yeah. huge concern right across the North. In What's the updated to position this morning, just Dr. Archibald, because we're pressed for time. Just spell it out for us. So, um, as it stands, uh, we had communication last night. I spoke to the Secretary of State that the, the Derry and Straban um, deal will be going ahead and the deal signing that was scheduled to take place this week um, will hopefully go ahead this week. Um, and then we we need to see the same happening for the other deals for Cosby Coast and Glens and for Mid South West. Um, the, the funding commitment on those needs to be on pause as well. Um, my understanding is Belfast is going ahead, but um, at what I have in black and white at the minute is that the Derry and Strabane deal is going ahead, and so I'm waiting for further information and clarification from Treasury. Can we really trust this government, given how all of this was handled, given the fact that they pause a scheme on a Friday and then they take the pause button off on a Sunday? What does it say about the administration we're now working with? Well, I think we, we have to judge people on their actions. I think, as I, as I reflected, um, we have heard this government talk a lot about resetting and, and rebuilding relationships. I think there needs to be a little bit of reflection at this point on how things have been handled over the past couple of days. I will play my part. I will work constructively with everybody um, to try and do my job as effectively as possible. So just to be clear, two city deals you think are safe, two still at risk. Is that the picture this morning? So uh, there, we understand two are, are going ahead as planned. Um, there is a pause on the other. And obviously I am making the case that that is reversed immediately because we need to give okay. certainty to those projects as well. OK, let's talk about other pressures now just briefly. How worried should somebody this morning sitting at a house valued at £400,000 be about the prospect of you raising their rates? Well, and we had a consultation on revenue raising in relation to rates earlier this year. Um, of over 1,400 people uh, responded to that consultation, um, and I have now considered those responses. I'll be bringing um, proposals to my executive colleagues so um, just to in be the clear, next will, few will weeks. Some people and, be paying more um, on the rates bill. Is that, is that what we can expect here? I will be bringing proposals to executive colleagues in the next couple of weeks well, you, you um, and I won't now, want to preempt um, the outcome of those discussions. I'm very clear that our rate system needs to be fair and progressive and equitable so, and so it that needs means some to people align will be paying more. with what we're trying to achieve yeah. economically. But, but just to be clear, that means that some people will in fact be paying more at the other end of this process. Uh, I will be bringing proposals to executive colleagues to discuss in, in the coming weeks and I won't be preempting what the outcome of so that will be. So you're not ruling out that prospect of that happening for some people out there? I think that we will obviously be discussing those proposals and making them public in, in coming weeks. OK, Dr. Keith Archibald, we'll leave it there. Thank you very much indeed for your time this morning. Now, let's reflect on that with the chief economist from Grant Thornton, Andrew Webb, and also we're joined this morning by the political editor of the Belfast Telegraph, Suzanne Breen. Andrew, let's start with you on the decision around casement because you did compile this assessment as to what it potentially could have been worth to Northern Ireland. I think you came up with a figure of £106 million. Just so how damaging now is this decision, the fact that it's not now going to be ready for the, for the football? Yeah, I mean, massively a massive strategic mistake in not getting this over the line in time for the Euros. Uh, just to be clear, the £106 million that, that we came up with in Grant Thornton was just for the Euros. I mean, there would be a stadium there generating positive economic and positive social impact for decades. So, you know, that, that £106 million was just those five games that were scheduled in. I think the, the bigger issue is that, uh, you know, our international reputation 
takes a massive dent here because we are now showing that we can't deliver a major infrastructure project. And when you think about trying to attract inward investors, they want to know that you are a well-run, well-governed uh, place that can deliver. And this sends out a really significant message that we can't, and that's really unfortunate. But you are, you are an economist, of course. You're well aware of the wider economic picture. You surely can't be surprised that we have arrived at this position, given the pressure that we know on public services and spending are needed elsewhere. I mean, there's there's a whole uh, narrative around the, the the black hole that has been uncovered. There there can be money found for things when money needs to be found. That's the, that's never been an issue for the UK government when they need to find money. It appears. I mean, this this whole narrative around a 22 million black hole. They they they've inherited what they call a mess, but they can they can approach this in different ways. They don't so, what have do you think really happened here time. with the Casement decision? I think the the issue is there has been delay and there has been obstruction and you know the the costs that have uh, come forward. I I don't have sight of what how those costs have been arrived at. Yeah. But what I do know is that to deliver this project in time for the Euros would have generated a really significant economic impact uh, and now we don't get and it. And what do you make of the, the new price tag of over £400 million that's now been put out there by, by Hillary Benn? Does that, does that tally with your sums? We haven't been involved in, in scoping any of the construction costs of this. We but were asked... From what very, you see from the outside? I, I mean, I, I, I'm not a quantity surveyor. I don't yeah. know how to price up a stadium. I, yeah. I, can, I can do several things, but that's not one of my tricks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting, no doubt, that it has risen dramatically over the course of a period of time, and yet that's used as one of the reasons now for, for not going forward. Suzanne, let me just turn to you. Uh, how do you think all this has been handled by Hilary Benn? I think it's been handled abysmally by Labour. I think the past 48 hours has shown that shoddy, cheap, cynical moves towards Northern Ireland are definitely not the sole prerogative of the Tories. Casement has been a massive issue in Northern Ireland, getting the Euros for the past year. And what Labour should have done was to release a statement, announce its decision in normal business hours and let the Secretary of State go there before the media, um, let the government answer questions in the House of Commons and take the hits man up front up, but we didn't get that. What did we get instead? A statement that is put out at 10 minutes past seven on a Friday evening, burying the bad news. Parliament has risen for the conference season. It's not back until October the 7th. And I think this was very much an action by a gutless government and it doesn't um, or give a good omen for the future. Of course, the government would say that they have their procedures for doing things, although it is very interesting to note the timing of this announcement, as you say, coming after the main evening news uh, on, on Friday night. Where does this leave us, do you think, in terms of casement going forward from here? Well, I think um, the GAA has been really badly let down. Um, this all goes back to 2009 when there was meant to be a multi-sports stadium. That didn't happen. The DUP rejected that and really casement has been left in limbo. I think the sadness about all this is that it became an orange and green issue. It never should have. But yet we find Lucid Talk polling for the Belfast Telegraph showed that the overwhelming majority of nationalists and alliance supporters wanted the Euros at casement. Only 12% of unionists did. I have to say that I, I think unionists shot themselves in the foot um, over this one. Northern Ireland now is the only part of the UK that won't be hosting these games. And not only that, when we actually look forward, Northern Ireland will be the only part of the UK that doesn't have a venue that is capable in future of hosting such events. Cardiff has won, Glasgow has won, London has won, Belfast loses out. And that doesn't just affect nationalists, it affects the entire community in Northern There's Ireland. There's the real possibility now that this will become something for the executive to deal with. It's going to land on the executive's lap, basically, to try and this, find this extra funding. Is there a possibility this could turn into a bit of a battleground, do you think, given well, the wider economic pressures in Northern Ireland? I think it might, and I think the DUP might be playing to their base on this. I think that would be very, very regrettable. It's up to the politicians now to rise to the occasion and there to be a united effort by Stormont. OK, Andrew, let me just talk to you a moment or two about the city deals and the fact that we now have two, we're told, are back on track, yeah. two very much still, still at risk. How much store do you put in these city deals? Because a lot of it, of course, is money that's out there that's to intends to bring in more money. So how, how much can we rely on this, these programmes, do you think? Well, they were described when, you know, certainly when Belfast was announced, it was a generational shift and it was going to make, make massive economic difference. 
I mean, we're talking about a billion of, of potential investment over the, the lifespan of these city deals, which is really, really significant. I mean, to be consistent, I've, I've been on record in the past suggesting that, you know, if it was me, I would have spent all the money, if possible, on housing with 50,000 people in, in need of housing. Uh, but there are some really good projects in there, particularly around tourism and, and trying to make us more productive as an economy. So, you know, if we don't get these over the line, again, big economic benefits fall by the wayside and our reputation suffers. Of course, we got this week the programme for government. We also got a pretty bleak financial assessment from the finance minister, Keith Archibald, about the pressures that they're under at Stormont right now. How much longer do you think can our politicians withstand not raising more revenue in Northern Ireland if we're to put ourselves in a much more sustainable position? Unfortunately, I think that has to come really quite soon. I think we're facing what I would call our Scotland moment. You know, Scotland have had their budget in the last number of weeks where they've had to impose some really significant cuts and, and you know, I think 500 million or so on, in terms of the scale of what they've had to do. I think we're facing into that. I've always preferred the idea that we, we get our house in order first in terms of spending well and spending efficiently, but you know, that can't deliver everything. And so there has to be a balance between efficiency and delivering services well and revenue raising. Okay, politically, Suzanne, of course, a big sell around the programme for government. A lot of people raising questions as to where's the targets, where's the timelines and all of this. Where do you think we are now uh, in terms of the executive's position around this? Well, I think it's obviously good that we have a programme for government. We haven't had one from 2015. Um, and it is hard for four parties with totally different ideological views to agree on things. But my God, aren't we setting the bar low in so many ways? The terrible state of public services in Northern Ireland. And really, we, we can't have a programme for government that does set out those targets. People are you know, very pleased with the style of the new executive, the way that the First Minister and Deputy First Minister are conducting themselves, the spirit of cooperation there. But the time for style is over. We now need substance and we need changes made, decisions taken at Stormont that affect the lives of ordinary people in Northern Ireland. And just in a word or two, do you think this executive is capable of grasping that nettle of revenue raising? I think the jury is out on that and certainly there haven't been very positive signs so far. Yes, and so where, where do you think we, we, we go from here in terms of the wider executive plan around all of this? Do you think are we heading for perhaps deadlock at some stage in the future around this? Is it a potential this could unravel? I think that that remains to be seen. It will be a really, really big test of those ministers to see um, can they actually deliver. OK, Suzanne, we'll leave it there. Thank you very much for talking to us today and also as well to you, Andrew. Well, that's it. All we have time for this week. Mark will be back with the view on Thursday at the usual time of 10.40. And of course, if you have missed any of our programmes, you can catch them on the BBC iPlayer. But from everyone here on the team, bye for now.